Oh, it's good to be here. I'd rather be here than prison, I know that. Uh, take a drink of this. I'll turn this on. Because apparently I forgot to turn it on last time and people don't like that. I'm a Pentecostal preacher is what they say because I move around too much and I'm too, too ambitious. I got too much energy. But uh, you know, I'll just do what the Lord tells me to do. It's good to be here. Thank you, Pastor, for the opportunity to preach. I'm not actually Pentecostal. That was a joke. For those of you that didn't understand, uh, I enjoy your piano playing, brother. My grandma back there said she enjoyed your piano playing. She was raised Nazarene. I said, this is making you think of the Nazarene church, ain't it? She said, yeah, we're about to start running and shouting and, and dancing down the aisle. Uh, no, but it's, it's good to be here. There's no place I'd rather be than church. Thank you for the opportunity, Pastor. Um, I've had a lot of opportunities here lately to travel and preach here and there. And um, I get a lot of opportunities to go more east out to North Carolina, up in the woods. And, and I've, I've learned a lot of things, Pastor. I haven't been to college. I'm not the smartest guy you'll ever meet. But experience teaches you more than anything else. I've learned that in life. Um, going to these churches, I've learned two different things. When it comes to the independent fundamental Baptist church, you have three circles. This is what I've learned. And I'm going to get pegged for this and people are going to hate me for this, but this is just how it is. You have the Baptist Mafia. They're the perfect, picture-perfect group of people. I mean, if you make a mistake, you're never going to preach again. You're never going to be allowed to teach again. You can never do anything again. Galatians chapter 6 does not exist to that group of people. There's no reconciliation. You must live perfect in their standards and in their rules. Not by the Bible. They don't know how to rightly divide the word of truth. They don't understand some of their doctrines. And then you have this false other side of the spectrum where they're compromisers. And they've, they've lost their feeling of the Holy Spirit. And they once remember the Holy Spirit. And they've decided to replace that with what makes people feel good. And, and I'm pretty passionate about this, Pastor, because I'm a young 20-year-old young man, young man, and I'm here to say there are some of us still that believe in good, old-time, King James Bible, premillennial, dispensational, rightly dividing the word of truth, living by the book, doing it the way God tells us to. There's no reason to compromise, and there's no reason to stray from the straight way. We need to stick with the straight way. Over there in 2 Kings chapter number 6, there were some young men with Elisha. Now, Eli this has nothing to do with my sermon. We'll get there in a minute. Now, Elisha was a man of God. Elijah passed down his mantle to Elisha. Right. And Elisha took that. And if you study, Elisha said, give me a double portion, right. which means twice as much of the Spirit of God as Elijah. And I began to study that. And study your Bible, friend. Elisha performs twice as many miracles as Elijah does. That proves that God's got some power. God's got a spirit that we need. We don't need someone's personality. We don't need someone's standards. We need the book. We need the standards of the Bible. And we need the power of the Holy Ghost to meet with us every time we meet in this house. We have lost touch of the Holy Spirit of God. I'm a Pentecostal when I go places because I preach on the Holy Spirit. And they say, whoa, 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 you're stepping on our toes now. Friend, without the Holy Spirit, there's no salvation. Without the Holy Spirit, there's no movement. Without the Holy Spirit, what you have is a lot of activity with no, no anointing. You have a lot of movement with no power, which means no lives are being changed. People's ears are being tickled. People feel good. You, you, you can't get them to the altar by the sermon, so you beg them to come to the altar. You give a second altar call. Friend, if the Holy Spirit's done, be done. Go home. Don't keep going. And I want to say that I'm very passionate as a young man to say we are not that. We are not that end of the spectrum and we are not the other end of the spectrum. We are King James Bible believing Christians that believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to walk in the Spirit. We need to let the Holy Spirit lead us, make our decisions for us. Not base our decisions based off of what somebody else has said. And not base our decision off of things that are happening around us. But simply based off of saying, God, tell me what to do. Show me where to go. I want to stay in the straight way. As I was saying over there in 2 Kings chapter number 6, there's these sons of the prophets. And Elisha was teaching them and he was walking them down the straight way and they say to Elisha go over there and read it in verse number one of second Kings chapter number six they say this way is too straight for us T-O-O -O, meaning that it was too narrow it was too hard now the world nowadays say that we are too strict let me clarify something real quick it has nothing to do with strictness. It has absolutely everything to do with a straightness. We are straight. We are by the book. We do what God tells us to do. We don't just have rules for no reasons. That's the Baptist Mafia. 
We follow the Holy Spirit of God. And there are a lot of people compromising because we're too straight for them. They can't just stick with the old time singing. They can't just stick with music like that. They can't just stick with the piano and the guitar. They can't do that anymore. They have to get your emotions going. They have to get you to the altar somehow without the Holy Ghost. And that's a compromise, friend. We need to live in the Holy Ghost of God, anointed on us, filled with the Holy Ghost, so that we can make a difference in this world. If you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter number four. That was free. If you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter number four. If you were here a little while back, uh, about two months ago or so, I preached from Ephesians chapter number four. And I preached on grieve not the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to pretty much preach the same thing, but I'm going to go at it at a little bit of a different angle. And I'm going to, I'm going to maybe uh, add some, some scripture in here. Uh, with that, the Lord has really burdened this on my heart. Didn't know what I was going to preach today. I was sitting back there with Miss Doctor, with Doctor Keaton back there, and uh, she said, "Man, you look nervous." I said, "I am nervous. Uh, I don't want to do the wrong thing. I don't want to not be led by the Holy Spirit of God." And she said, "Just do what God tells you to." And then Brother Dustin May said the same thing to me. He said, "Well, you just stick with that book, and the Lord will tell you what to do." And they were right. Stuck with the book today. Got some got some prayer in. The Lord's told me what I believe is burdened on my heart. Ephesians chapter number four. We're going to begin in verse number one. The Bible says, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for another day of life. I thank you for giving me the opportunity to preach your word. I pray that you would fill me with the anointing, the power of the Holy Spirit of God, Lord. Make me disappear. Hide me behind the cross. Let me say everything you want me to and nothing that you don't, Lord. Open the hearts and the souls of the people uh, here to listen, people watching online, people that will watch this later, Lord. It's in your son's perfect, precious name I pray. Amen and amen. We see, you may be seated, you see, we see here in Ephesians chapter number 4, Paul's the writer of this book. He says, beseech ye walk worthy of the position which you are called. We are all called to something. We all have our calling. I'm called to preach, thank God. Pastor's called to preach. He's called to pastor. Thank God. Brother Barry, I've heard him preach. He, he's called to preach. Brother Tom, he's called to preach. Uh, uh, but we also have teachers and we have people who are called to other ministries. It's a ministry to uh, clean the church and vacuum and, and take care of the trash and do things like that. We are all called to something as believers in Jesus Christ. Everybody who is saved and has accepted Christ as your Savior, we are all called to something. Now, it's up to you and God and between you and God to decide what that calling is. I can't tell you what that is. Is. Your pastor can't tell you what that is. Only God can tell you what that is. Pastor wasn't the one who told me I was called to preach. The Lord was. Now, I do believe he was sitting around waiting for me to say, hey, I'm called to preach. And he said, you're right. I've been waiting for you to say this pretty much. And I was like, well, I need to get where I need to be. And I need to be led by the Holy Spirit of God. I need to make sure I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Now, we all have our calling. And Paul tells us, the Lord through Paul tells us how we are supposed to walk in the vocation which we are, are, are given, in our responsibility as a Christian, in what you are called to do, whether that's to be an usher, whether that's just to pray with people, whether that's just to pray for your church and be a prayer warrior, or whether that's to visit the elderly people or go to the nursing homes, whatever it is you're called to do, you are called by God, therefore you need the anointing of the Holy Spirit to do that. I'm not a Pentecostal, friend. This is simply a Bible doctrine. The Holy Spirit is in the Bible, and we need the Holy Spirit of God. I, I'm sick and tired of going to these churches that are twice dead and plucked up by the roots. They do everything perfect. They've never made a mistake. Nobody has ever left their church for the, the right reason. Nothing ever wrong goes on in their life. And I'll, quite frankly, I'm tired of that, Pastor, because we're all sinners. We're, we all make mistakes. That's just life. But even though we make a mistake does not mean you cannot jump back on your horse and ride your pony for Jesus Christ and move on in this fight. Now, as a believer in Jesus Christ, Paul tells us, how to walk worthy of our calling with all lowliness and meekness. How about that? He, he tells us to put ourselves down at the bottom first. Amen. Down at the bottom first, friend. Down at the bottom first. You don't start at the top. You don't start at the top. You don't start in the middle. You start at the bottom. I pour concrete for a living. When I started pouring concrete, all I did was wash the tools. And I hated it. But I had to work my way up in order for someone to say, you know what, I trust you to do this by yourself. 
I trust you to go out there and perform that project and do it the way it's supposed to be done. I had to work my way to that. I had to show that I had some meekness and lowliness about me first. I had to say, I'm willing to get down and dirty. I'm willing to clean the toilets and I'm willing to do whatever I'm supposed to do for Christ before I say, I'm going to take that next step. As a young man preaching and having the opportunity to travel, I didn't just jump into that. That didn't just happen. I've been preaching for six years. I spent a little time out there in the world and didn't do what I was supposed to. But even when I came back, I had to sit down, show myself worthy, show myself faithful. And people had to see me and see me preach and know that I'm being led by God before they said, hey, can you come preach to our men at our men's meeting? Can you come preach to our teens at our youth meeting? Can you come preach our youth rally? I'd like for you to preach in front of our church. They have to see and know you're led by the Holy Spirit of God before you make that decision. We have churches nowadays living and running off of activity. Activity. They're all high. They're all mighty. This is what they give up, friend. They give up power for popularity. They give up the power of God for popularity. They're not lowly anymore. They're not meek anymore. We need to be meek, friend. We need to be low in order to be used by God. We have these men who, who once were great preachers, once had anointing on their lives, once were willing to go to the old country church and just preach the death, preach the roof off the place, watch people get saved, see lives be changed. But they gave that power up. For popularity. They gave that power up so more people would come to their meetings. They gave that power up by saying, well, the King James, it might be the best version. It is the only version. They give up their worship. They give up their music. They decide to go the way of the world. I am here to testify to you, church. I have traveled. I have seen churches. It is fake. Nothing happens. Souls don't get saved. No lives are changed. It's all fake. You have to have the Spirit of God in order to see somebody's life be changed. The whole Holy Spirit must reside inside of you in order for your life to be changed. It is fake. We have churches in this town that are fake. We have churches right outside this town that are fake. We have preachers, pastors right here among us that they just wanted the popularity so bad they gave up that anointing. They gave up that power. You have to have that power. I met with my pastor right back here in this office. And he said, now, now, Lucas, I want to pray with you. I want to pray that you're filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. I said, I would love that, pastor. I want that. I was already talking to him about it. I brought it up before he did. And he said, I'm going to pray this for you. And he put his hands on me and he prayed for me. And something different happened to my life then. And something different happened to my life then, friend. You have to have that power. And I truly believe there are men growing up in my life, growing up in church, a good godly Christian home. I watched men with power and anointing on their lives preach and preach and preach the word of God and be led by the Holy Spirit and they gave it up for popularity. They gave it up because they knew they'd get more people on the other side. You know what that does? That sends people to hell. I watch it firsthand and friend. I go to these churches and it's fake. It's fake. It's fake. There's nothing real about it. There's no anointing on it. There's no power on it. And it's fake. But that, that means easy believism is not, is not okay, friend. You can't just tell somebody to say a prayer. That's not salvation. That's not salvation. You can't just tell somebody to say a prayer. It has to be a personal decision in their heart. They have to decide to say, I'm going to turn from my wicked way and go to Jesus. In order to have that power and have that anointing, you must be lowly. You must be meek. What is the point in living in the Spirit of God? Later on in this chapter, verse number 12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry. For the, for, for the work of the ministry. Earlier on in that chapter, it says that we are one body. One body. We are one. We're not separate. We're one. If you are a believer in Christ and have Christ residing inside of you, we are one family. We are one faith, one body, one baptism, one faith, friend, which means we need each other. I say this every time I preach because it's the truth. We need each other. We have people every day deciding this just isn't doing it no more. This just isn't doing it no more. And they go off into that world and they decide to believe some doctrine that's just foolishness because they don't want to be in this anymore because we're mean to each other. Because we don't help each other. We need each other. We need each other. We need each other. We need each other, church. We need to love each other. We need to care for each other. We need to know that we love each other. This ought to be the safest place in your entire life. The church house must be the safest place you know to go to anytime you make a mistake. Anytime something goes wrong in your life. You must know. You need to know that this is the safest place you can go to. That depends on every one of us. Not just the pastor, not just the deacons, not just the elders. That is every member of the church. 
People need to know they can come in here and get help. When I was out there in the world, I realized I was going off the road. I needed help. You know where I came? I came back to this church. I talked to Dustin May and I talked to Paul Howe. I said, brother, I need some direction. I need some help. I've been out there. I don't know what to do. Uh, I knew this was a safe place. I knew this was the place I needed to come to, friend. That is up to us as the members of the church. In the Baptist mafia, that, that's rude. I understand, but that's just how it is. It's organized religion. It's fake. In the Baptist mafia, their church is not their safe place. We get them. We're outcasts. I, I, I will take the title right now that I am one of the outcasts. Because that's just part of life. Because I believe in reconciliation. And I believe when someone makes a mistake, they can still serve Jesus Christ, friend. And I believe they don't truly understand their Bible all the way when they decide to just kick someone off the wagon when they make a mistake. That church, the organized religion Baptist mafia, people do not feel safe there. They come to us. Imagine that. Imagine that. The people they make fun of and the people they rag on and the people they say aren't really doing what's right. We're the ones they come to when their church says, well, you made a mistake. We're done with you. Yeah. Imagine that. Yeah. Think of dwell on that. Yeah. It happens all the time. Those men over there in Second Kings, those sons of the prophets do nothing. For Christ. Study your Bible. They do nothing for Christ. Elisha ends up getting back on the straight way. Back on the straight way. And, and you know what's going to happen? The friends of yours that decided to compromise and go out in that world, when they really need help, they're going to come back to you. If you stay on the straight way. If you don't compromise. There are some pitfalls to compromise, and friend. And the biggest one is souls. I'm telling you, I go out in this world, I go to these churches, people are dying and going to hell because they're not, they, they're, they don't believe in the Holy Spirit. They don't believe in the gifts. They don't believe in someone being called anymore. They don't believe in Holy Ghost anointing anymore. They just don't believe it. They think we're ridiculous. They think we're radical. We're called to be peculiar, just to clarify. But they think we're crazy. We're crazy. I'm telling you tonight, friend, we need to be led by the Holy Spirit of God. And we're going to look at that in this chapter moving forward. Uh, turn to verse number 30, Ephesians 4, verse number 30. The Bible says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. You're sealed by the Holy Ghost of God until the day of redemption. But Paul tells us, Grieve not the Holy Spirit. And then earlier on, he tells us some ways that we do grieve Him. Some ways we push him away, some ways we vex him, some ways we, we, we decide to say, uh, you know what, I, I'm, I'm smarter than that. The first thing I'm going to ask you is, are you in tune with God? Are you in tune with, the Holy Spirit is our comforter on this earth. He is the one of the Godhead that is here with us, that is, that is comforting you and living inside of you. And it leads you, tells you what to do, tells you where to go, tells you what decisions to make. Are you in tune enough with the Holy Spirit to know when he's telling you what to do, friend? That's being led by the Spirit of God. Because you are either led by the Spirit of God or you're not. There's no in-between. You're either led by the Spirit of God or you're not. Pastor, I truly believe some people will never see God to the best that we can on this earth just simply because of their unbelief. That, that organized religion, I, I feel bad for them because I believe some of them have actually never seen a move of God. They've never seen it. They, they've, never, they've never believed enough. They've never had enough faith to let God come into a building and let God come into a place and let God anoint them with power to make a difference in people's lives. I believe they'll never see it. They never have. They don't know what they're missing. And it's our job to teach them. It's our job to tell them, you need the Holy Spirit of God. You need that anointing. You need that power. And it's not just for the preachers. And it's not just for the singers. And it's not just for the people who play the instruments, whatever they're called. Uh, it's for everybody in Christ's family. It's for everybody that's saved. You are called to be filled with the Holy Ghost of God. And you are called to make an impact in this world. Being filled with the Holy Ghost will make an impact that nothing else can make. You can compromise for this world. You can tickle people's ears. You can do whatever you want, friend. But without being filled with the Holy Ghost of God, nothing real will ever happen. Nothing real will ever happen. The gifts of God are real. They are real. I am one to tell you they are real. I have preached with Holy Ghost anointing and I, I didn't even remember what I preached on and lives were changed. And I've also gotten up and preached in my flesh and nothing happened. What's the difference? What's the difference? It's not that I was better one day than I was the next. I'm a filthy sinner. It's because I let God fill me up enough. How do you do that? 
You have to empty yourself in order to be filled with something else. You can't compromise, friend. Well, when does compromising stop? When does compromising stop? I, I see people all the time, pastor, they'll say, well, I, I just don't see this as that big of a deal. Three years later, I mean, they're just, they're gone. They're out there. The, the boundaries are knocked down. They're, they're so far gone that, that because they decided to compromise on one tiny little thing, now they're out there believing some, some, some horrific doctrine. I mean, whatever that may be. I have friends personally that I can tell you by name that once believed like this and once lived like this and they gave in to one little compromise. And then they ended up way out there, way out there. That's sad, friend. That said, we can't compromise as Christians. We can't compromise as Christians. There's few churches like this left. There's few churches with a pastor that believes in the Holy Spirit. There's few churches that believe uh, enough to let the Holy Spirit enter inside this building. We should not lose our feeling of that. You should not lose your feelings in your convictions. We, we have a generation of people who have lost their feeling. They've lost their conviction in verse 19 of Ephesians chapter number 4. You'll see that they lost convictions. They, they, they give their mind over. They, they, they give back into the world. Well, how does that happen? By peace, by peace. You think Satan's just going to be like, hey, you know what? Come be a drug addict. Let's do it together. No, you're not going to walk out there and just one day say, hey, I'm going to be a drug addict. That's stupid. You're not just going to walk out there one day and say, hey, I'm just going to start drinking every night. That's ignorance. That's not how it happens. He gets you piece by piece. Well, you can listen to that song. It's not that bad. Well, you don't have to read from this version of the Bible. It's not that bad. Let's just understand something. Let's just help us understand, understand something. No, stick with what God told you to do. Stick with what that book says to do. Don't compromise, friend. Don't compromise. We need more people my age to say we're not going to compromise. Pastor, I've learned something as I've had the opportunity to, to go out and, and see places. And now these people are going to see me preach and they're going to know I'm talking about them. But anyhow, it's just the truth. I see a generational difference. It's the generation below you, but right above me. Below you and right above me. Uh, like my dad's age, I guess you would say. That generation has decided to compromise. It's that generation. Yeah, it's that generation. Which, no offense, it's most of you. It's most of you. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying you've compromised, but I'm warning you, church. I'm warning you. It's most of you. It's your age group of people. Pastors about your age. That's about right there. They're the ones who have decided that the way this man of God went, straight and narrow for all those years, just isn't quite good enough. It just isn't quite good enough. So they decide to change some things. They decide to change their worship. They decide to change their music. They decide to change this. When is it going to stop? When will it stop? You can't just not have a boundary, friend. You can't just decide every now and again that you're going to knock down a boundary. You have to set a line and not cross it as a Christian. You have to set a line and not cross it if you want to be filled with the Holy Ghost of God. Because you have to be completely empty of the world in order to be filled with the Holy Ghost. We, how do we, we need to understand that as a church. You have to be completely empty of the world to be filled with the Holy Ghost, which means everything you do must be clean. Clean. The music you listen to, the people you hang out with, the things you say, the places you go, the decisions you make, everything needs to be a choice based on the Holy Spirit. And we need it. We need it. We need the Holy Spirit to lead us in every way. We lose feelings. We lose our convictions. When you lose your feeling, you lose your conviction. When you knock down boundaries, that's when you lose your convictions. They're giving up on their convictions. I have friends that have given up on convictions. I'm radical now. I'm far. I'm way out there now. I'm just far out. However they want to say it. You know, we used to be the normal people. Pastor, we used to be normal. Yes. It used to be normal to come to church like this. This was common. This is what it was supposed to be like. We have a world that is turned upside down. And the Bible tells us there will be a strong delusion. And they will come in with craftiness. And they will trick you, friend. You need to beware of the strong delusion of this world out there. Because it is the so-called independent fundamental Baptist church nowadays that is that delusion. It is the so-called independent fundamental Baptist mafia that is that strong delusion. That is trying to convince you that it's just not that bad to make a compromise. Don't compromise. 
Don't compromise. Don't compromise. There's a pitfall to compromise. Somebody is looking up to you. Somebody is looking up to you. I love it when a parent comes up to me and says, my son, he looks up to you. I love it and I hate it because I'm an idiot and you probably shouldn't look up to me. But I love it because that gives me a little bit of responsibility. And I'm going to tell you, somebody is looking up to you. Everybody in here, I guarantee you, whether that's your kids, whether that's someone you work with, they are looking up to you. They will see when you compromise. They will see when you make a change. They will see when you decide to cut down a boundary. They will see it. You, it is up to us as Christians to be led by the Spirit of God and not compromise for this world. I'm begging you, church, understand tonight that we need to not lose our feelings and convictions and we need to live in the Holy Ghost power of Jesus Christ. We wonder why these churches have no power. Because when you... I'm going to preach this because I believe it, Pastor. This book is different than any other book in the world. I'm going to preach this because I truly believe this. This book is different than any other book in the world. There is no other version of the Bible. There is one Bible. And there's all these other books that they want to replace it with, friend. And why, when are you going to stop when they take a word out every now and again? When they want to revise it? When they want to fix the perfectness of Christ? When is it going to stop? There's a power that comes from this book. There's a power that comes from your King James Bible. You wonder why these pastors and these preachers have no power. It's because in their study time, they're studying from a different version. It's because when they get up to preach to you, they read from the King James to make you feel good. The reason there's no power is because they haven't been studying from the power. There's no other explanation. That's a compromise. That's a loss of conviction because they've given up something they know is right. They know it's different. They know it's special. This book has power, friend. I can testify. I lived on the other end of the spectrum. I went to a Southern Baptist church. I read from a different version of the Bible. It had no power. This book has power that the other ones do not have. Amen. Call me a Bible thumper. I really don't care. That's the truth. This is the truth, friend. We need to not compromise. We need to not lose our conviction. Secondly, we see that we, we tend to love ourselves. You lose conviction and then you lose the power of the Holy Spirit because you love yourself. We're selfish. Thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Goodman. They came all the way down from Michigan to give me these because they said they watched me online and they noticed that I sweat buckets. And always have to loosen my tie. And before I forget, I just want to thank y'all. I do use them. <laughs> we love ourselves. We tend to love ourselves. We, we lose the power of the Holy Spirit because it's all about us. It's all about you. It's all about what people think about you. What, what will people think about that? What will people think about this? Pastor, I get told all the time, well, you probably shouldn't go to that meeting. You probably shouldn't preach for that, Pastor. I get told that all the time. I'm tired of it. I hate it. I always say yes. Get used to it. I never say no. If the Catholic church down the street asks me to come in to preach, you better bless God. I'll go in there and preach the hell out of them. If the Pentecostal church down the street asks me to treat, preach, bless God, I'd go in there and preach the hell out of them. Tell them you can't speak in tongues and all that. But I would preach the truth and I would preach the word of God. If the Methodist church down the street asked me to preach, Pastor, I'd go. I would go. I would preach. I would preach there. I'm never going to say no. Don't tell me to say no. But when you get with this Baptist mafia, they care about themselves so much. They care about what people think. Yes. I've learned this. I've learned this. And I was told this, and I preached it just because of association, but it's personal now. It's personal now. I've had pastors call me and say, sorry, brother, you're not going to be allowed back at our church because you've preached for such and such up there. There you go. That's it. How about that? How about that 20-year-old man? Single, not married, pure, I'm a virgin. Uh, I haven't made a mistake like that, thank God. I haven't had some scandal go on in my life. All the glory to God. I'm not perfect. God's done everything for my life. I haven't done anything wrong. Why? Because I associate myself with that man? It's because they care about popularity. They care about what people will think. Church, we'll lose the Holy Spirit of God when we start doing that. Pastor, we'll lose the Holy Spirit in this church when we decide to start saying, well, cherry pick who we're going to preach for, who we're not going to preach for. Well, I'm not going to let them in because that'll step on toes. I like Brother Tony Hopkins in Sunday school the other day. He walked over here to his board and he said, yeah, I'm a Ruckmanite. I don't care what you think. <laughs> and he walked back over here and started writing, but that's you saying this is what I am. 
This is what I believe. I don't care what you think. Pastor, when we decide to start saying, I care what people think. I care how many people are going to come to my church. Now, nah, you'll drop. It'll fall down. You see, we've had people leave this church here in the recent, but God's still blessing us. People are still here. My grandma just a minute ago said, man, it seems more full than it used to be, bless God. That's the truth. Because when the Holy Spirit's there, God is still working. When the Holy Spirit is allowed to be in that place, God is still working. When we decide to love people more than Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit will be quenched. You'll grieve him, friend. He'll leave. He ain't going to be here. we got to have him. Nobody will get saved. Nobody will be converted to Christ. Nobody will give their life back to Christ if we don't have the Holy Spirit of God. So are you in tune with Christ? I'm asking you that tonight. Are you in tune with the Holy Spirit? Or are you, are you just fiddling with the world out there? Have you decided, ah, it's not that bad. I just watch pornography every now and again. I just cheat on my spouse every now and again. Yeah, I'd be ignorant to think some of the people in here don't do that. I mean, we're humans. We're flesh. We make mistakes. Come on now. Well, I just lie every now and again. I just gossip every now and again. Well, it's not quite that bad. No. No, you need to be living, being led by the Spirit of God. Have you lost your conviction, friend? Have you given something up that you thought you'd never give up? My sister, I love my sister. My brother-in-law is a youth pastor here in this town. And my sister's obviously married to him because he's my brother-in-law. And uh, when I chose to, to go to a different church for a little while... I gave up some of my standards and some of my convictions. And th this hurt my feelings. My sister said, she actually disagrees with me on some things. And she said, Lucas, you know, I'm glad that you're here with us. But you just gave up some things I never thought you'd give up. Mm, that hurt. You just gave up some things I never thought you'd give up. You just had some standards I never thought you'd drop. Church, don't drop your standards. I'm back, thank God. I've gotten back. The Lord slapped me silly and told me which end was up. And I thank God for that. But church, we need to know when we are led by the Spirit of God and when we're not. We need to know when we're making a decision based off of what God wants us to do or if it's based off of what our emotions want us to do. In this same passage, it says that your, your, heart, it can, it, your heart blinds you, friend. Your heart is deceitful. Your heart can trick you. Your emotions can trick you. You can't go off your emotions. You can't go off of your heart. You can't go off of how you feel. Pastor just a couple weeks ago said he felt like not getting back up and preaching. He said it was hard. I wanted to quit. But he didn't go off his emotions, thank God. He went off the Holy Spirit and God said, get up behind that pulpit and preach. Because that's what you're called to do. And he did that. Amen. And he did that. And we're still here and we still meet. There are times where I've been discouraged and I didn't want to get up here and preach. But pastor had asked me to preach. And I said yes. And the Lord said, get up there and preach right now. Amen. Get up there and preach. And there were times where I said, I'm going to switch it, Lord. I just, this is just a hard one. Uh, people just aren't going to like me at this meeting. I know they don't want me to preach this. I know they disagree with this. And the Lord said, no, preach what I told you to preach. And every time I do that, someone comes up to me and says, I needed that. Amen. Every time. Amen. Every time. Because it's led by the Spirit of God. When I do it in my flesh, nothing ever happens. Nothing ever happens. We need that power. How else do we lose that power? We lose our feelings and convictions. We love, our, we love ourselves. We love the flesh. We also have a lying tongue. How about that? You know what the Bible says about our tongue? It can bring forth life and it can bring forth death. Your tongue can save somebody's life and your, your tongue can kill somebody, friend. Your tongue can cause somebody to kill themselves. Your tongue can cause somebody to lose their job. Your tongue can ruin somebody's life. Your tongue is powerful. Your thoughts and the intents of your heart are powerful. The, the thoughts and intents of your heart, that, that's where it happens before it comes out of your mouth. That's powerful. We need to learn that our tongue is powerful. Sticks and stones will hurt my bones, but words may never hurt me. That's the biggest lie I've ever heard in my life. That's the biggest lie I've ever heard in my life. Words hurt. People hurt my feelings all the time. I'm sensitive. I can work out there in 98 degree weather and be fine. But when people say something about me, that hurts. That hurts. That's different. That hurts. If you're led by the Spirit of God, you ain't going to be lying about nobody. You ain't going to be talking about somebody you shouldn't be talking about. You ain't going to be talking about something you don't know anything about. You're not going to be talking about it because that's not what God wants you to do. 
And you need to be led by the Spirit of God in that. You need to be led by the Spirit of God in everything that comes out of your mouth. 1 Peter 4 says, speak the oracles of God with everything you say. Everything that comes out of your mouth, it is your responsibility to speak the oracles of God. And if it doesn't glorify your Savior, don't say it. Don't talk about it. What's the point? I'm tired of it. I'm, I'm tired of the fake Christianity pastor. I'm tired of a church that has no power. I'm tired of preachers that don't get the anointing. I'm tired of people who fill themselves up with so much of the world that there's no difference when they say something. Nobody is devoted to Christ anymore. In Ephesians 4 it says, give no place to the devil. Give no place. No place to the devil. That means no compromising, no giving in, no switching your ideas on this and that. It means sticking with the book, being led by the Spirit of God, and giving no place to the devil. It means what it says, friend. It means give no place to the devil. Which means if you have to think twice about it, you probably shouldn't do it. You probably shouldn't say it. And if you don't know it's what God wants you to do, ask Him. He's good like that. He'll tell you. I promise, he won't lie to you. He won't trick you. He won't say, psych. He's not going to do that. He's not like that, friend. He loves you. He wants you to do what's best for you. He wants you to do what's best for you. He wants to lead you. He wants to show you what to do. But you have to be empty of this world to be filled with him. Amen. How do we not understand that? You have to be empty of the world to be filled with him. To be filled with holiness. To be filled with something that can make a difference. We need people today to say, God, I want a double portion of your spirit. I want to be anointed with your power every time I preach. I can study all I want. I'm not the smartest guy. I'm not. I, don't, I, I, I can't just rip the Bible apart the way so I can't teach like Brother Tony Hopkins. I can't do that. that that's, that that's just good teaching. And, and I like it, brother. I like it. I, very few teachers can convey something I don't understand from the Bible and help me understand it because I'm dumb. And it's hard for me to understand. That's the truth. This man can teach. But in order for you to teach and it make a difference in somebody's life, it has to be led by the Holy Spirit. Amen. You see what I'm saying, church? Everything we do has to be led by the Holy Spirit. It can't be your emotion. It can't be what you think is best. It has to be what God wants you to do. We need that power. What will having that power do? What will having that power do? Well, look at Pentecost. The Lord told the disciples, Terry, in Jerusalem, wait. You cannot teach or preach until you're renewed with that power. It's the same power. It's the same power. Okay? We need that power. That's the same power we need now. I'm not a Pentecostal, friend. I just believe in the power of God the way these people who don't have faith do. Elisha had to have the faith to perform the miracles he performed after he said, Elijah, I want a double portion of your spirit. He had to have the faith to perform those miracles. Where is your faith, church? Where is our faith, pastor? Where is our faith? We have no faith. The reason people aren't getting saved, the reason lives aren't being changed, is because we don't have the faith that can happen. Oh, it's quiet now. Amen. It's quiet now. You gotta have that faith, friend. You gotta have that faith. What is your faith? What does your faith look like? Is it fake? Is it based off of rules? Is it based off your religion? Or is it with your relationship? How devoted are you? How much do you want God? How much do you want God to fill you? How much do you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? How much? It's up to you. It's your decision. It's your decision to bring the Holy Spirit around yourself. It's your decision to bring the Holy Spirit around your family. It's your decision to bring the Holy Spirit in this church. It's your decision personally. It's not about the people beside you. It's not just pastor's responsibility. It's your responsibility as a believer in Jesus Christ to let the Holy Ghost fill you and lead you. How devoted are you? How devoted are you, church? I, I, I didn't plan on telling this, but I'm going to be ready for the funny farm after this one, Pastor. This is why I believe in the Holy Spirit, because I've seen Him work in my lifetime. I've been to meetings where it's real. Don't get me wrong. I've been to meetings where it's fake. I've been to meetings where they thought it was real and it was fake. And I've been to meetings where it was real. And I've been to meetings where it's twice dead and plucked up by the roots. And when I came back into this church and said, Pastor, sorry I left. 
I started studying that. I started studying that. I started thinking, man, why, why does my preacher not have anything on it? Why does it have any power? Why does it make any difference in anybody's life? Why is that? I started reading some books, Pastor. I started reading some books like uh, Famous Experience, uh, Deeper Experiences of Famous Christians. Anyone ever heard of that book? I read that book. I started reading some books and, and here and there. And they, they led me back to the Bible. And I started studying the Holy Spirit. What it really means to be filled with the Holy Ghost. The difference it makes when you're filled with the Holy Ghost. And I believe that there is a huge, vast difference when you truly decide to be filled with that power. And we need that power. And it is a responsibility of every believer to have that power. We need to get that power. The Lord tells us to get that power. He told the disciples to get that power. Before Peter preached at Pentecost, he had to have that power. We need that power. There is a difference in a just normal person who gets up and talks about Scripture and somebody who gets up who has that power. What is the difference? The difference is that power. We need that power, Pastor. We need preachers with that power. We need teachers with that power. You said we were going to appoint some elders? We need some elders with that power. We need some church members with that power. We need some people who clean the floors with that power. That power makes a difference and people can see it. People can see it on you everywhere you go. People can see it on you at work. People can see it on you at the store. People can see it on you everywhere you go. They'll see there's something different because you have chosen personally in your heart to be devoted enough to Christ to say, I'm going to empty myself of this world and be filled with that power. You need that power. I talked to pastor back there in his office. I said, I just, I want that power. I want it. I studied the Holy Spirit and I want it, pastor. I want it. I want it. And then I went over to a camp meeting over in North Carolina. I talked to another pastor friend of mine. I said, I want it. I want that power. I want a difference. I want a difference. And then I learned. Then I learned. It's about how devoted you are. It's about how willing you are. It's about how many meals you're willing to fast. It's about how many, how, how many days you're willing to give up from doing something fun to study. It's about how, how devoted you really are to Christ. Like, you got to get up early for work. I mean, getting up earlier to study, to start your day in that study. How many hours are you spending in prayer? How much are you talking to God? How much are you just laying in your prayer closet saying, God, talk to me. God, speak to me. God, tell me what to do. Tell me where to go. Tell me what decision to make. Even when everyone thinks I'm ridiculous, even when everyone thinks I'm crazy, tell me what to do, God. And you're getting a hold of God. Touching the hem of his garments and letting him lead you in every decision, in every aspect of your life. We are lost sheep out there, friend. We have to have the Lord lead us or we will just wander off in this world and be confused by the strong delusion. We need that power now more than ever. I urge you, church, want it. Want that power. Study that power. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit in your life. Know that you need him. Know that you, you should want him, friend. You should want him. Parents, you should want your kids to get it. Pastor, I believe Pastor wanted me to, to study that and wanted me to get that power. He told me that back there. He said, you're studying it, son. I'm, I'm going to pray for you. In due time, God will give it to you. In due time, you'll be filled with that power. In due time, the Lord will fill you with the Holy Ghost. Parents, how many of your kids are going to be able to say, you know what? I, I can proudly say my grandmother sitting right back there and my grandfather sitting right there has prayed for me every day of my life. Every day of my life. Even when I was running the other direction, I know she was kneeling down in her bed every night and saying, Lord, bring my Lucas back. Bring him back. Show him what he needs to be doing. Put him where he needs to be. I know that. How many people are going to have somebody in their life say, I know that that person prayed for me. I know that that person prayed for me every day of my life. I know that person wanted me to be led by the Holy Spirit because they wanted me to understand what a relationship with the author of that book is. Not just to know everything about that book. The Baptist Mafia knows everything about the book, friend, but they know nothing about the Creator. They don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. They're not led by the Holy Spirit. We need to be led by the Holy Spirit of God in every decision we make. I had a brother of this church Last Sunday night as I was walking out, he shook my hand and he said, let the Lord lead you in the decisions you make. Oh, if that's not the truth, friend, we need to be led by what God tells us to do. Let God make your decisions, church. Let God make your decisions. Don't make them off of what you want. 
Don't make them off of your feelings because we oftentimes lose and end up somewhere we ought not be because we make a decision based off of our emotions and off of our feelings and off of what other people think and off of our friends and off of this and off of that. Let God lead you. Have a relationship with the Creator. Have a relationship with Jesus Christ to the point where you can be filled with that power. I urge you tonight, church, please, if we could just get some people in Temple Baptist Church, Pastor, who would say, we need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Yes. We need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Yes. Women, it's not just for the men. Women can be filled. Right. Women can have power in prayer. We, I mean, if you're going to get up here and sing, if you're going to play the piano, if you're going to play the guitar, play the bass, whatever you're doing, you've got to have that power to make that difference. Please, church. Learn that we need that power. Are you in tune with the Holy Spirit tonight? Are you letting the Holy Spirit make your decisions for you? Are you being smart about that? Or are you making decisions based off of your emotions? Based off of what you think is best? Let the Holy Spirit lead you. Lord, I thank you for this day. Thank you for another day of life. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to preach your word. <clears throat> Lord, I pray that if there's anybody in here who who has decided to just compromise here or there and get out in that world a little bit, Lord, that they would decide to say, I want to be led by the Spirit of God. And I don't want to compromise. I don't want to give up some of my convictions, some of my standards that the book gives me, Lord. I pray that they would come to you and know that you have the answer to everything. Lord, your mercies are new every day. And it's worth following you. Thank you for the opportunity. It's in your son's perfect and precious name I pray. Amen.